Welcome to the Word and Sword TV program presented by the Newton Church of Christ. We invite you to call in with your Bible questions at 828-465-3009. That's 828-465-3009. In this episode, we look at four different lessons from the Word of God. First is a lesson on the church, specifically the worship of the church. When you look at churches in our society, you see many different ways in which they worship. More and more worship services look like a rowdy concert at the county fair versus reverent homage to God. But what does the Bible say about the worship of the church? Next, we will study the final lesson in our Elementary Principles series. In this installment, we examine the judgment. That is, we look at a few points regarding the final day when Christ returns to hold all men accountable and issues a sentence of where we will spend eternity. Our third lesson focuses on a story from the New Testament about the forerunner of Christ, John the Immerser. We will study from Mark chapter 6 to consider his murder by Herod Antipas and what lessons we can draw from it. The final lesson in this episode is on culture and faith. Atheists claim science and the Bible, or science and God, are mutually exclusive. That is, they believe science is contrary to the Bible and God. This is utterly false. So we will discuss the fact that science actually supports creation. Again, we invite you to call in during the broadcast, or at any time, to ask your Bible question. Call 828-465-3009. Again, that is 828-465-3009. Also, you can reach out via our Facebook page at facebook.com slash word and sword. That's facebook.com slash word and sword. Or send us an email at contact at word and sword.com. Now, let us turn to our studies and learn from God's Word. As we consider worship, I would like us to start by thinking about the revelation of God. And one of the important things we need to keep in mind is God did not reveal His will in a way that it would be difficult for us to understand, in a way that He kind of tricks us. You know, some people have this idea that the message of the Bible is too complicated, too difficult to understand. And that's really sad because if you believe in the God who created the heavens and the earth, who had the power to bring these things into existence, and a God who loves us, then we have to believe that he revealed his will in a way that we can understand it and that he preserved it down through the centuries so that we have the original message that was given. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul writes this, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So Paul tells us there very specifically that he has received the revelation and we can understand it. Now, when he talks about the mystery here, let's understand in the context of his writing here and different places in the New Testament, the mystery is this idea that the plan of salvation was a mystery in the Old Testament. It was hidden. It was concealed. There were hints that were given along the way. There were prophecies that were given so that when it came about, men could see it and understand it. But it was hidden before Christ came, before the apostles were sent out to proclaim the gospel to all nations. That was hidden away from man. But now Paul says that he, as he's writing this letter, has received that revelation and he has written it down. And when we read it, when his audience read it long ago in the first century, when they read that message, they could understand the mystery. So it's no longer a mystery, but it's something that they grasp, that they comprehend. 
And that message, again, has been preserved by the same God who revealed it, the same God who sent his son to die for us. It's been preserved down through the centuries. God has overseen that in his providence so that we have the message that was originally revealed in Ephesians 5, 17. The apostle says, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So, when we are urged to understand it, when we're told we need to understand it, when we read it, we can know what God's message is, then we need to have confidence in it. We need to accept that. We can know God's will. And that's true with regard to worship, how God would have us to worship, because God has revealed things in some great detail at times, very specific things. For instance, if you go back to Exodus chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12, and look at where God revealed the Passover to the children of Israel. This was when the children of Israel were in captivity in Egypt. The plagues had been brought against them. Nine of them had been brought against them. God is preparing his children for that 10th plague, the death of the firstborn. And he reveals the Passover and the details regarding the Passover so that they will be delivered from the judgment that was coming against them. And this Passover is a, a feast that they were to observe going forward as a people to remind them of what God did for them in delivering them out of the land of Egypt. And just notice Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 through 6. Exodus 12, 3 through 6. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next to that house or next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make for your count, make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. Now, notice all those details that God gives them, very specific things he wants them to observe in order to receive the benefit of the blessing of being passed over so their firstborn don't die when the angel of death came through the land of Egypt. The details include the tenth of the month, the tenth day, not the ninth day, not the eleventh day. They're to take that lamb and to pull it out. And it is to be a lamb. And he says it can be from the sheep or from the goats. That means it couldn't be cattle. It couldn't be oxen. It couldn't be things like that. So it had to be a sheep or a goat. And he says, you take that a male, not a female of the first year, not the second year, third year, fifth year, not some old goat, if you will, at 10 or 12 or however long they live. But he says a male of the first year. So God gave them very specific details and they were to slaughter it on the 14th day of the month. They separated on the 10th. They slaughter on the 14th, not the 13th, not the 15th, but on the 14th. So that's just for us to see an illustration, when God revealed his will, there are times when he gave very specific things to the people and what they were to do. Now, very similarly, in the New Testament, God gives some very specific instructions related to worship. If you look at 1 Corinthians 16, for instance, 1 Corinthians 16 and verses 1 and 2 talk about the collection that's to be taken up on the first day of the week, it does specify the first day of the week. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Now, as a good Bible student, you'll recall that in the Old Testament, they were to set aside the Sabbath or the seventh day of the week as a day that was holy unto God. In the New Testament, it's not the seventh day of the week, but God reveals it's the first day of the week. So it's not the second, it's not the fifth, and it's not the seventh now, but it is the 
first day of the week on which the saints assembled, and in that assembly, they lay by in store. That is, they took up a collection. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But then in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, just to note this again, Acts 20, verse 7, says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So the saints assembled on the first day of the week, and there are certain things that they did on that first day of the week as an assembly or in an assembly as a congregation of God's people. So God reveals things in detail. He revealed the day on which we are to worship in both 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, and Acts 20, verse 7. And so we need to respect that just as the Jews in Old Testament times, had to respect when the Passover would occur. They needed to take it on the 10th day, that is, separate the the lamb on the 10th day. They needed to slaughter it to kill it at twilight on the 14th day. So just as they were to listen to what God had specified, we are to listen to what God has specified. He didn't leave worship up to us to figure out. He didn't leave it to us to try to decide what it is that we are to do as an activity or an action in worship that would be pleasing to him. But he told us, here's what I want you to do. So remember in John chapter 4, John 4, 23 and 24, he says, but the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. You see, there are a lot of people who get the spirit part right. They're very appreciative of what God has done for them. They're very enthusiastic about giving Him praise. But then they miss the truth part. And there are some who get the truth part right. They get the various actions or activities of worship, the various acts of worship correct. But then they miss that spirit part. But the Bible says here, and Jesus speaking specifically, worship in spirit and truth. So there are details. There is truth that God has revealed about worship that we need to observe, that we need respect if we're going to be pleasing in his sight. And we see these things revealed. There are four of the five acts of worship revealed in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. In Acts 2, remember, it's the day of Pentecost as observed in Jerusalem in the first century. The Jews have gathered from all nations. Peter, the other apostles, are preaching to that crowd. And it said that about 3,000 that day were baptized when they heard that message. They heard that they were to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins, Acts 2.38. It says, following up on that in verse 41, that about 3,000 who gladly received the word were baptized, so they received the remission of their sins. And in verse 42, it makes this note, Acts 2, 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So they engaged in four different acts of worship that are revealed here. That is, they had the apostles' doctrine, the teaching from the apostles, they had the fellowship, that is the sharing together is what that word means. And that's the idea of they gave to a common collection, as we'll talk about in just a little bit. But then they were involved in the breaking of bread. And that's a reference to the Lord's Supper. And by the time Luke wrote this, it kind of became a um, way to express the Lord's Supper. And then in prayers. They continued in prayers. Now, later on, it talks about how that they met day to, uh, daily in the temple and they broke bread from house to house. They ate food from house to house. But 
In verse 42, they're talking about the breaking of bread and of prayers and of studying the word of God and taking up a collection among that congregation or that group of people, and that that's what they were doing as the children of God. So there are four of the five acts of worship that are revealed there. The other act of worship that I'm sure you recognize and you see is mentioned over in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19. Ephesians 5 verse 19, remember he says here, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So there's the singing that is involved there. That's a simultaneous reciprocal activity when you are speaking to one another. That's a congregational action. It's a group action. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. So you have the five different acts of worship, which is the teaching. It's the giving. It's the observing of the Lord's Supper the breaking of bread, it's the prayers and the singing and teaching, admonishing one another, praising God and doing those things. So those are the five things that we want to look at in detail in this lesson and note that God has given us that pattern. He's given us that revelation that we might know how to worship him in spirit and in truth. So let's get into these five acts of worship in detail. First of all, let's go to Acts 20, verse 7, and think about study as being an important aspect of worshiping God, of assembling together and drawing closer to Him. In Acts 20, verse 7, as we read a moment ago, it says, Now on the first day of the week, When the disciples came together to break bread, to observe the Lord's Supper, we'll talk more about that, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So there's the study of the Word of God. We need to open up the Word to learn about the Lord, to learn about His will, how we are to please Him, how we are to know to live our life, how we live as a family and our relationships to each other, how we are to deal with our neighbors. A lot of different things that the Word of God teaches us and reveals to us. And one of the things we need to understand is we need to study that Word. Not man's ideas, not man's um, opinions, not his um, personal philosophy of life, but we need to study what it is that the Word of God tells us, what it is that the Lord would have us to do. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, it says this, preach the Word, that is the Word of God, preach the Word. Be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. So we need to study the word when it's comfortable, when it's not comfortable, in season, out of season, when we want to hear it and when we don't want to hear it. You know, there are times when truth can be very inspiring, very encouraging, and we crave it and we want it. But there are other times when truth reveals our failures, reveals our weaknesses when it goes against what we want and it's uncomfortable and we really don't want to hear it, but we need to hear it. And so when we gather together, we need to study the word of God. It's going to lay bare our soul. It's going to encourage and strengthen and inspire us and help us to grow that we may be more like our Savior. We need to study the Word of God. And when we gather together and we hear someone teaching a lesson, we need to make sure that it is in harmony with the Word of God. In Acts chapter 17, verse 11, we have a great example here. In Acts 17, verse 11, when it talks about the brethren at Berea or the the people at Berea who are listening to the Apostle Paul teach. And it says in Acts 17, verse 11, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They searched the scriptures. Now, the scriptures here is referring to the Old Testament. And what Paul is doing is he's 
taking Old Testament texts and he's explaining to them how they have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And they're going back and examining. And is that really what that text was talking about? Does that make sense in what Paul is telling us that it means? So they search the scriptures daily. And you and I, when we gather and we assemble with a congregation and we hear a man teaching a lesson, And he's saying, well, here's what the word of God says, and here's how the word of God applies in your life. We need to examine that in light of the scripture. It's not just a passive hearing and just a gullible acceptance of anything somebody says, but we need to actually study it. We need to meditate on it. We need to test it in light of what God has revealed in his word. And when we study, it's going to lead to edification. It's going to enlighten us about God's will. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 beginning, the Apostle Paul writes this, and this is very interesting to me here, where he talks about this is what God has equipped the church with. In Ephesians 4 verse 11 says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? Why did he give these different roles within the church? He says, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, According to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So you think about what he's writing there, about the purpose of these different ones that have been given, the apostles and prophets. Those were men who had miraculous gifts to be able to reveal and to confirm the word of God. And then you have evangelists and pastors and teachers, that's preachers and elders over congregations and teachers of the word that they were all given. Why? For the equipping of the saints to help us to be united together in the faith, to have a knowledge of the Son of God, that we may be more like the Son of God, that we may be conformed to his image, that we would not be tossed to and fro by false doctrines that are out there in the world, that we will grow up in Christ, that the whole body would be edified together. So it's a teaching, a building up that these people are are here to serve the congregation or to serve the church. So study is an important part of our worship together. In fact, it is a significant portion of our time together. As we read a while ago in Acts 20, verse 7, it says that Paul was speaking to those brethren who had gathered on the first day of the week, and he continued his message until midnight. In other words, there was a big emphasis given to the study and investigation of the Word of God so that they may know the will of God. But another part of worship is prayer. Prayer is absolutely vital to us being together as a people seeking to honor God, seeking to know him, seeking God's favor. And again, in Acts 2, verse 42, it says there that they continued steadfastly the apostles' doctrine, fellowship or breaking of bread and prayer. As those saints gathered and assembled, they prayed to God. And there are various things related to prayer that are involved with prayer. Like we pray to give thanks and to praise God. We thank him for the ability to assemble, which many people have had taken away from them in recent times. And we appreciate the fact when we can get back together and assemble together. So we pray and we thank God for that. We we pray that he will hear our prayers and thank him that he would hear our prayers. We praise him for his power, for his love, for his 
patience with us to give us time and opportunity to grow. So there are a lot of things involved in prayer and thanking God and praising God. We pray for ourselves, our struggles, our troubles, our our health, our finances, our job, our work, our relationships with other people. We we pray to him for wisdom and know how to get through those things for for boldness in living for him in a world that the pressures against us serving our God. And we need to pray for boldness, for faith, for strength, for wisdom, and how to deal with those situations when we are challenged and for times when we are tempted. We need to be praying to God and seeking his help in that. We need to be praying for others, for their spiritual well-being, for their physical well-being, for their blessings, blessings to come in their life and for them in their circumstances of life to come to know God if they don't know God, to draw closer to God, to have the strength they need to face challenges in their life. So we have study and we have prayer. And we also have the idea of singing together in worship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul is here addressing problems in the assembly at Corinth. They had descended into chaos and they had a spirit of competition among themselves. But something he mentions here in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 15, he says, what, are the, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit and I will also sing with the understanding. So singing is just as much a part of worship as prayer. And singing is important. As we read a while ago, it talks about in Ephesians 5 verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So we are speaking to one another. So we're assembled together. We're speaking to each other the words of the song in order to help to build each other up. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, a parallel verse here mentions this. Colossians 3, verse 16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So we're teaching and admonishing one another. We're praising God in our singing. But we are also teaching and admonishing one another. We're building each other up and we are encouraging each other. Stay the course. Be faithful. Consider your life. Consider your soul. Think about God's love. Think about the Lord who gave his life for you. So we are teaching and admonishing one another. We edify each other in our singing. Now, singing is is an important part of worship. And it's not something that is there to entertain us. The musical part of our worship is not there just to please us and our desires, our opinions. We need to understand that it has a function of building up the soul, not just making us emotional about things, though there are emotions involved in that as well as in teaching, as well as in prayer but that it is there to encourage us to teach and admonish, as Colossians 3.16 says here, and it's to sing from the heart. We can't overemphasize that enough. It needs attention that we are singing to each other. We're, we're not playing something. We're not banging on an instrument or plucking an instrument or anything like that. That's, that's not the picture that's given to us here. What is revealed to us is the speaking, the teaching, and admonishing, and we need to have zeal when we're doing that, but not to be ecstatic like a heathen idolater, maybe, but to be somebody who's singing sincerely, thoughtfully, reverently, but with emotion in spirit as well as in truth, as we are assembled together. Another part of worship that's revealed in the New Testament is the giving. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, it 
is Paul's instructions to the church at Corinth and what they are to do in taking up the collection. And notice what it says here, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. So they had a responsibility and a duty as a congregation to help out needy brethren in another area, which in this case was Jerusalem. But here's the thing about it. Notice what he says about the actual collection, the taking up of that collection. First of all, he says it's on the first day of the week. When you gather on the first day of the week, do this. He says he gave this order to the churches of Galatia. So here's the implication of it. The saints were assembling on the first day of the week. That was a regular practice, a regular habit. And he says, when you do that, you need to take up a collection. And you take up that collection when you're assembled, he says, storing up as you may prosper. So as you make money, as you have an income, you take a portion of that and you give that in the collection when you take it up on the first day of the week. So that seems rather simple enough. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Here it talks about this idea of giving, and it's a willful giving. That is, we voluntarily do it. We, we shouldn't be pressured into doing it. No one should be manipulated into doing it, coerced, but to give it willingly of themselves. In 2 Corinthians 8 verse 1, the apostle says this, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So they gave willingly. It's a voluntary contribution. It's, it's not something where they were pressured to do it. Now, they were encouraged. They were urged to do it. But it's not as though somebody coerced them into giving it. And it's not like the brethren at Corinth sat down and went through everybody's finances and told them, here's what you need to give and, and here's the amount that you need to, to provide for this cause or for this uh, occasion in helping these saints who are in need here. It wasn't like that. In chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, notice verses 6 and 7 what he says about it. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So there you have the idea that you give as you have purposed in your heart. So 1 Corinthians 16, as you have prospered. 2 Corinthians 9, as you have purposed. So individually, we make that determination how much we give. And we are to give as we've prospered. So if we prosper once a month, then we give once a month. When we are assembled with the saints, we prosper weekly, we give weekly. Now, there are some people who maybe they get paid once a month and they spread out their contribution over a month's time. So each assembly that month, they give a little bit of money. But the idea is you do it as you've purposed and as you've prospered, not as somebody else tells you to do it, but as you determine to do it, you give it willfully and you need to give it cheerfully to the Lord. And this is how a congregation supports its work, whether that's helping the saints who are in need as these occasions are that we have seen here, or whether it's to support the preaching of the gospel, as we see in Philippians chapter 4. Here you have an occasion where Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, and he's thanking them and praising them for helping him 
and having fellowship with him in teaching the gospel. Notice what it says in Philippians chapter 4, and you get down here to verse 10. He says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. So he's saying You've given, and that's done well. In verse 14, nevertheless, you have done well that you were shared in my distress. Now, verse 15, he says, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. So they were helping Paul, sending him money in order that he might have his needs provided for so he could preach the gospel. So they sent to him once again, he says in verse 16, but here's something I want us to also grab out of Philippians chapter four. Not only the work that the church was involved in, that is the church at Philippi, in sending that money to the apostle Paul to carry out the teaching of the gospel, but notice verse 18, how it's referred to here. Indeed, I have all and abound, I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. There's a question that comes up sometimes. Well, is our giving really part of worship? Yes, it is. Paul describes it here as a sweet-smelling aroma, a sacrifice that's well-pleasing to God. So our giving is a part of our worship, just as much as study of the Word of God, of prayer that's offered to God, of singing that takes place, to praise God, to teach and admonish one another. It is a part of our worship. Now, here's what's different about giving compared to study or prayer or singing. Remember again in 1 Corinthians 16 that it is specifically tied to the first day of the week. So again, he says, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. So when they assemble, they're to take up this collection, they're to hold it in a common treasury. So when Paul showed up, they would be able to give that to him. So he wouldn't have to go around and collect all of that. So he says, do this on the first day of the week. God specified the first day of the week. That meant that they weren't to take up a collection on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday. They were to take it up in their first day of the week assembly. So think about it like this. When God said in Exodus chapter 20 that the Israelites were to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, that's the day they were to refrain from work. Now, if they decided, well, you know what, I think I want to observe that Sabbath on Tuesday, and I want to work this Saturday. Would that have been acceptable? Well, the answer is no, that wouldn't have been acceptable. When he specified the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, that's the day they were set aside to be holy, and they didn't have the right to change it. And when the Lord specifies to us that we are to take up a collection on the first day of the week, We don't have a right to change that. We don't have a right to say, well, we don't want to do that on the first day of the week. We want to do it another day, or we want to add all these other days of the week to do it. But we are to do it on the first day of the week. Respect what the Lord has revealed on that because he's been specific about it. Now, the last act of worship we want to notice is, of course, the Lord's Supper, or it's sometimes called the Communion because it's a sharing together. In Acts 20, verse 7 again, remember it said, now on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So they are gathering on the first day of the week and they're breaking bread. Again, that is a reference to the Lord's Supper. It's not a reference to a common meal, which they talk later in this section of scripture about eating food to satisfy the hunger. But here in Acts 20 verse 7, it's talking about observing the Lord's Supper, breaking of bread as it's shortened down. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 
1 Corinthians 11, Paul deals with the fact that the church at Corinth had perverted the breaking of bread. They perverted the Lord's Supper. They had changed it from a memorial observance of the death of Jesus Christ, of his sacrifice, into a common meal to satisfy hunger. To They turned their attention away from reverence toward Christ, thanksgiving, appreciation over his sacrifice to the satisfaction of their physical desires, their physical appetite. Notice what he says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 20. He says, therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others, and one is hungry and another is drunk. What, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Well, what's he saying in this? When you come together in one place, it's not to eat the Lord's Supper. He, he's not saying you're not trying to do that. No, in fact, he's saying... That's what you say you're coming together to do, but in fact and in reality, you're not doing it because you perverted it. And he says, one is hungry and another is drunk. And that's simply a reference to somebody sitting there, they're not eating anything, and another person is sitting there and they're getting full. They're they're filled up with that. So do you not have houses to eat and to drink in? Do you despise the church of God, shame those who have nothing? So When you eat for the satisfaction of your appetite, of your physical desires, go do that at home. It's not something you do as a a congregation. You don't gather together and part of your worship is to eat a meal together. He says you have despised the church of God in doing this and perverting it and changing it up that way, changing it from its intended purpose to what you have done for your own selfish desires. Notice as he goes on here, really read this and think about what he's saying. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Think about what he's saying there. He is saying when you gather together, you observe the Lord's Supper, and there are two things involved in that. That's the breaking of the bread, the eating of the unleavened bread, and the drinking of the cup or the fruit of the vine, which is grape juice. So those are the two things that are involved in it. It's not a meal. It's a memorial observance of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And again, this is tied to worshiping in spirit and in truth, because in 27 to 29, he goes on to talk about if you eat this bread or drink this cup in an unworthy manner, you'll be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. You are to examine yourself, have your mind in the right place. It's not on the physical appetite. It's on the sacrifice of Christ. And if we don't observe it with that in mind, then we are perverting the Lord's Supper, the communion that the Lord has given to us. And again, this is something that was tied to the first day of the week. In Acts 27, the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread. It's not something to be done on Monday or Friday or even Saturday, but he says it's something you do on the first day of the week. You assemble together, you remember the Lord's sacrifice. So as we think about this, There are five things the Lord reveals concerning our worship. There's the study of his word. There's the prayer that's offered up. There's the singing that is done. There is the giving on the first day of the week. There's the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. All those things we do when we come together and to assemble in order to worship him in spirit and in truth. He's revealed this. We can read it, we can understand it, and we can put it into practice in our life so that we are pleasing and acceptable to our God and Father in heaven.
This Bible study program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to call 828-465-3009 to talk to one of our members and ask your Bible question. Some of the questions we receive will be used on a future episode of the program to help others who may have the same question. Again, that number is 828 465 3009. In this lesson, we want to finish our study of the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ. And this last one that we're going to look at, eternal judgment, is really the driver of all other principles. It's what really gives the the power or the push for us to observe or to accept or to apply all these other basic principles, and really all of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let's begin by reading Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. You know, without eternal judgment, it really doesn't matter whether or not you repent. Without eternal judgment, it doesn't matter if you have faith or if you're baptized or if there is a resurrection of the dead, because eternal judgment is what makes us wake up and pay attention to the fact that there's a certain way we need to live. There is a need for us to listen to God and what he would tell us and how we are to live our lives. The eternal judgment is what looms before us and ought to motivate us in our daily life because we are going to face the judgment. We need to find out what it is. We need to find out how we are to prepare for it. And then, of course, we need to prepare for it. So let's look at what the Bible tells us about the judgment to come. And let's begin by looking at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 is an extended discussion about the judgment, about the return of Christ. And let's understand, first of all, that the judgment will come. It is definitely going to happen. In 2 Peter 3, verse 1, then, says, Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and by the commandment and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, Where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness. But as long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed or dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. You know, scoffers deny 
that there is a judgment coming. They deny that Jesus is the Christ. They deny even that God created the heavens and the earth. They deny this idea that men are going to be held accountable to God for the way that they have lived. And Peter is addressing this here. He says, you know, these scoffers are coming and they're going to say these kinds of things that where's the promise of his coming? Everything is just like it has always been. There is nothing different. He says, well, they willfully forget that there was a judgment on the world before in the days of Noah. In that great flood that destroyed all breathing animals, all men, all that walked the face of the earth, except for Noah and his family and the animals that were with him in the ark, they say he says they forget that they have willfully denied it it's obvious that it happened i mean you look at the evidence of the world around us and the scientific evidence the archaeological evidence the evidence in ancient societies that tell about the great flood and they willfully forget this but there is evidence that says there was this judgment on mankind <clears throat> in ancient times and god is going to bring another judgment similar to it. Now, the next judgment is going to be by fire. It's not going to be by a flood. And the reason that God is holding off now, verse 9 tells us, is because he's waiting for more people to repent and turn to him. He's waiting for more people to reject and repudiate their life of sin and to live for him and for his son. But the time... When it will come is not known. Peter wrote there, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Paul writes similar things in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 1 beginning, he says this, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, for when one says peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. So the time is unknown. You know, if you knew when the thief was coming, you would be there on guard and not allow him to come in to your home and steal your things. But he says he's like a thief. He comes at an hour that's unexpected. He comes when you're not anticipating it, when you don't think it's going to happen. And that's like the judgment. You know, people are out there all the time trying to figure out when the judgment's going to come. They make these predictions and they say, look at this world event and that world event and, and this thing that is happening. It, it's all futile. Because he says the day of the Lord is like a thief in the night. You're not going to know when it happens. So the judgment's going to come for sure. No matter what others say, no matter what men say, no matter what it may seem like in observing the world around you, the judgment will come. Secondly, the judgment's going to include the perfect judge. And that is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 5, John 5, verse 22, it says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Now, in a sense, the Father's judging us, but it's the Son who's going to sit in judgment on us on that day. And he's not going to show any partiality. He's not going to favor one group of people over another. He's not going to favor one economic class over another, one race, if you will, over another. And really, there's only one race. That's a human race. So he's not going to favor one nation over another, but he's going to judge without partiality. He's going to judge with perfect knowledge because he knows all things. He sees all things. He observes all things. So there's no partiality. There's going to be perfect knowledge and there's going to be perfect wisdom because he is God. He is deity. So there's not going to be any mistake making in the judgment or mistake made in the judgment. He is going to judge perfectly because he is the perfect judge and it's going to be by the perfect standard. In John chapter 12, verse 48, John 12, verse 48, Jesus said this, he who rejects me 
and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. We have the standard of the word of God to which we are going to be held in the last day. So what the Lord revealed in the New Testament is what you and I are going to be held to. Now, people in the Old Testament are going to be held to that standard. The Israelites are going to be held to the standard of the law of Moses. You and I, because we live in the gospel age, are going to be held to the standard of the gospel. As Jesus said, we're going to be held to what he said, what he's revealed. Now, Jesus revealed things himself while on earth. Other men recorded it, of course. And he revealed things through the apostles and prophets that he sent out in the first century to declare his truth, to declare that gospel. So we are going to be held to that standard, and it is the perfect standard. It's complete. All things have been revealed to us. In fact, Jude talks about in Jude verse 3 that the faith has been once for all revealed. You understand when you study the Word of God, when you look into history, that the revelation of God's Word, the revelation of the New Testament of Jesus Christ, was began, begun and ended in the first century. And we have it preserved to us, for us, today, through God's providence. It is a Word that is incorruptible. Yes, men pervert it, and there is corruption out there related to the Word of God, but we still have the incorruptible Word of God with us today. Many good translations in the English language, many good translations in other languages all around the world. We still have that Word preserved for us today, and it will be here to the end of time. Something else we need to understand about the judgment when Jesus returns, is we are going to be held accountable individually. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in his body, in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We will not be grouped together. We won't be grouped together as families. We won't be grouped together as congregations, as churches, as people who live in a certain nation or anything else like that. We will stand before the throne of our Lord individually, one-on-one, -on -one, judged according to that standard by the perfect judge. When we look at Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, the prophet makes it very clear that we are personally and individually accountable to God for our actions, and we're not responsible for someone else's. In Ezekiel 18, verse 20, notice what it says. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So you think about that. We will be held accountable individually by God. And that tells us that we're not guilty of our father's sin. And that goes all the way back to Adam. And that's a good thing. You know, there are a lot of religions out there that teach that we inherit the guilt of Adam's sin. And that's false. We're not. We don't inherit his guilt. We're not guilty for what Adam did. You realize we're guilty for what we have done. And I'm glad. I don't want to be responsible for anybody else's sin. I have enough to deal with on my own. And so the Bible teaches us that we stand before the throne of God individually. And it said there in 2 Corinthians 5, for the deeds we've done in the body, for what we've done while we've lived here, for our thoughts, for our words, for our actions, we will be held accountable. Whether or not we've labored in the kingdom of God, we've been a part of the kingdom of God, our relationship to our family, God's going to hold us accountable for that. If, we, if we've been mean to our family, bad to our family, we've not fulfilled our commitments and our covenants, with our family, like a covenant with a spouse, then we will be held accountable for that. We'll be held accountable for our morality or lack of morality. 
for the way we treated other people in business, whether we've been a good employee or employer or worker or contractor, whatever it might be. There's all these different things in life for which we're going to be held accountable. Now, it's not as though God's going to hold us accountable on some arbitrary measure. And it's not like he hasn't told us what we're to do. No, he has that perfect standard in his word that he's revealed, and we are told to live by it. And that is what he's going to compare to our life, whether or not we have fulfilled his will. So the judgment's going to come. We're going to be judged by the perfect judge according to the perfect standard, individually held accountable to that standard. And that judgment is going to be final. In Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writes about this idea of us being held accountable before God. And he says here, beginning in verse 5, Romans 2 verse 5, But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You see, he says, the Lord's going to judge us and he's going to either give us eternal life or he's going to give us eternal destruction, everlasting destruction. There's not going to be any changes after that. When the judgment happens, We're going to be sentenced and we're going to be rewarded either for our good or for our evil, either for living righteously and obeying the truth or refusing to obey the truth and living in wickedness. You know, the Lord talked about this idea of the two different ways and only two ways. There's no in between. There's no like. Well, I'm not going to make it into heaven, but I'm not going to be cast off into hell either. (laughs) There's none of that in the Bible. The Bible's very, very specific and plain and clear. There's only two destinies of the soul of man, either heaven or hell. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus said this on the Sermon on the Mount. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. There's the narrow way that leads to eternal life. There's the narrow way that is the path to heaven. And he says few people are going to find that. Not many people are going to make it to heaven. You think about the flood that we mentioned a while ago. How many people survived the flood? Eight. Eight people out of the population of the world survived the flood. How many people are going to go to heaven? Well, the Bible says it's few, very few, because there's very few people who are willing to live by the standard of God's word truly and really in their life, not just give it lip service, not just praise God and say that God is good or believe that God exists or even that believe that Jesus Christ exists and that he is the Savior. But those who obey the truth, as Romans chapter 5 talked about, it's those people who obey it. Those people who diligently seek to do the will of God, those are the ones that are going to go to heaven. And there's few. But there are many who follow that broad way. There are many who follow their own will instead of God's will, or partially follow God's will and partially follow their own will, which ultimately really ultimately really is following their own will. And there are many who are going to go down that path because it's easier, because they don't want to put in the hard work. They don't want to exercise discipline in their life to serve the Lord. So there are two ways to go. 
two outcomes to this judgment, either heaven, eternal life, eternal bliss in the presence of God, or hell, which is eternal torment, eternal destruction, pain and suffering. So we need to really think about this, that the judgment is a basic principle in the word of God. And there are some people today who deny that there's going to be a judgment or deny that there's going to be an eternal punishment. But the Bible is very clear that is going to happen. There is going to be an accounting, a reckoning of all men in their lives before God. And there's going to be an outcome, a sentence of that, either heaven or hell. So we need to prepare for it. The question is, have you prepared for it? If you understand and recognize, you know what, there is a judgment and I've been pushing that out of my thoughts. I've not been living to get ready for that judgment. We want to help you. Please let us know. Contact us and we will help you to understand the will of God, what it says about the way you are to live, to please him, how you can prepare for the judgment that is to come, that you may walk that narrow path in this life and realize heaven and peace and blessings before the throne of God in the next life. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. We invite you to go to our Facebook page and leave a comment or question about this episode. Our members are ready to assist you with any questions and will work to share a Bible answer with you. The web address for our Facebook page is facebook.com slash word and sword. That's facebook.com slash word and sword. Or you can simply go to Facebook and search word and sword TV program. Jesus honored his cousin John by saying that there was no one greater born among women. He did this because of John's great faith. He had a deep commitment and conviction about his relationship with God, about God's will, about God's word. He was very loyal to the Lord, and he was bold in teaching his truth. He was one who wasn't persuaded by the opinions of others and what society thought about him, but he was faithful to the Lord. And John was loved by the people for this, at least by some of the people for his faith, his commitment, the teaching that he did, but he was hated by others. The reality is that truth divides. And when John spoke the truth, it divided the people. Some loved him and many hated him. The difference between those two groups was their attitude toward the truth, their hearts, whether they were receptive to God's will and willing to make changes in their life or whether they were stubborn to follow their own will and refuse to submit to God. We want to examine a part of John's life, particularly the account the New Testament gives of the beheading of John and draw some lessons out of that. And we're going to look in Mark chapter 6 to read the account that Mark records about this event, and we'll draw out some lessons in just a moment. But in Mark chapter 6, first of all, let's read verses 14 down through 16. Now, King Herod heard of him, for his name had become well known, and he said, John the Baptist has risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, It is Elijah, and others said, It is the prophet, or like one of the prophets. But when Herod heard, he said, This is John, whom I beheaded, he has been raised from the dead. So the first thing is, we see that when Herod hears about Jesus and the things that Jesus is doing, he thinks it's John. He thinks John has been raised from the dead. Now, he had put John to death, which we'll read more about in a minute, but he's thinking, well, Jesus is John. That's why all these things are being done. All this power is being manifested in him. All these miracles are being performed. Now, This Herod here, let's understand, is Herod Antipas. 
There were several Herods mentioned in the New Testament, and this is the Herod Antipas who is thinking that this is John raised from the dead. This is the man who was tetrarch or ruler over Galilee and Perea at this time. He's the son of of Herod the Great. Herod the Great is the Herod mentioned in Matthew chapter 2, the one who tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby. This is his son. Now, he's also the uncle to the Herod that's mentioned in Acts 12. In Acts 12, remember that there is a Herod mentioned there who beheaded James and arrested Peter, was going to execute him as well, but Peter escaped from the prison and got away. But this is the uncle to that Herod. So you think about the wickedness of these men, this this family that has a reputation and a habit of opposing the representatives of God, those who are spokesmen of God. In fact, opposing even the Son of God as an infant and as an adult. And it is this Herod, Antipas, that not only we read about in this account, who beheaded John the Baptist, but he's the Herod before whom Jesus stood when Jesus was on trial. Remember, Jesus was first taken to Pilate. Pilate sent him to Herod. Herod sent him back to Pilate. This is that same Herod. And in that account later, we read that when Jesus appeared before him, he wouldn't speak to him. And because of what we read here, we understand why. Because this is the Herod that put his cousin John to death. But be that as it may, let's understand that these Herods have a history that is anti-God. And it may be that here, because he believes in the resurrection, obviously, that he has a guilty conscience or he has this great fear about what is being done here, about Jesus being John raised from the dead. But we go on now and let's read Mark chapter 6, verses 17 through 20. It says, For Herod himself had sent and laid hold of John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. Because John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Therefore, Herodias held it against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man, and he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things, and he heard him gladly. So John is arrested for his teaching here. He's arrested for preaching against the sin in which Herod and his wife Herodias were involved, and that sin is the sin of adultery. It mentioned Philip here. Philip and Herod or Antipas, that they are half-brothers. And Philip was married to his niece Herodias. On one trip, history tells us, on a trip to Rome, Herod Antipas went to Philip's house and he stayed with him. And while he was there, he struck up a relationship with Herodias, and it was a mutual thing. It wasn't just one-sided. But they struck up a relationship, and Herodias ended up divorcing Philip and marrying Herod. It may be that he was perceived to have more wealth or more power or whatever it was. She ended up marrying her other uncle. So you see how this family thinks and you see how they behave. You understand they have a level of corruption. And we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. But as John then goes in this situation and preaches against this adulterous relationship and tells him it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife, his life is in danger. In Matthew's account, in Matthew 14, verse 5, it says that Herod initially wanted to kill John himself. But as the account we read and as the other accounts mention, Herod feared the people because the people looked at John as a just man, as a righteous man. And Herod didn't want a riot or rebellion on his hands by taking the life of John. So he spared his life, even though initially he wanted to kill him. He feared the people. Well, as time goes by and John is in prison, 
Herod calls for him out of prison and he hears his teaching. Now, John's going out and teaching him and he's not necessarily harping on the issue of adultery day after day, week after week, however long this time period is, but he's teaching him other things. And it just goes to the point that, yes, we do need to expose people's sins, but we need to teach them the fullness of the gospel, which we'll talk more about later. But be that as it may, he was teaching him over time. But then an occasion arose where there was an opportunity for Herodias to act, and she did, and she was ruthless, and she had John beheaded. So let's read in Mark 6, verse 21 beginning. It says, Then an opportune day came when Herod on his birthday gave a feast for his nobles, the high officers, and the chief men of Galilee. And when Herodias' daughter herself came in and danced and pleased Herod, those who sat with him, the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. And he also swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. So she went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Immediately she came in with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, yet because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. And when he he went and beheaded him in prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took away his corpse and laid it in a tomb." So here he is, he's celebrating his birthday, probably intoxicated, and it certainly involves carnality here, because we see that Herodias' daughter, that history tells us is Salome, that she went in to dance before these men. Now, this isn't a case where a little three or four-year-old goes in and she's playing and acting out and acting silly in front of a group of adults, but this daughter of Herodias is a developed young woman. And her dancing is inciting lust in these men. So think about what's happening here. You have Herod, who's married to Herodias, who is his niece. And her daughter, who is Herod's stepdaughter, is sent in by Herodias to dance before Herod to entice his lust to set up this occasion, just read the parallel accounts, and she really orchestrated all of this because she wants vengeance on John. That's how perverse these people are. But Herod, and he's excited in his lust, uh, makes this promise to her, I'll give you anything you want. He says with an oath, up to half my kingdom. Now, everybody knew that he didn't mean he would literally give her half the kingdom. It was just a way of saying, I'll give you what you want. And she then, in consultation with her mother, says, I want the head of John the Baptist. So, because he made that oath before the others, he didn't want to back out of it. He would have been ashamed to do that. It would have been consequential for him, or there would have been consequences with it if he had backed out of that. And so he went ahead with it, and he regretted having to do that, but he did it. And, of course, John was executed. His head was brought, and she, that is Herodias' daughter, took it to Herodias as her reward, as an act of vengeance on John. Now, let's draw some lessons out of this. The first lesson we want to notice is that God has a strict law on divorce and remarriage. If you look in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus had been asked about divorce just for any reason. And he pointed out to the Jews who asked him that question in verse 6, Matthew 19, verse 6, therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. So God's law is one man for one woman for life. That's what he has laid out. That's his intent for mankind. But in verse 9, he gives an exception to that. And notice the exception. It's very strict. Matthew 19, 9. And I say to you 
Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. So you are to be married for life and cannot have another spouse except under one circumstance. If your spouse, your mate, commits adultery, they cheat on you, then you have the right to put them away and to marry another. Doesn't mean you have to put them away, but you have the right to put them away and to marry someone else, and you are right in the eyes of God. Now, Herod and Herodias and Philip, what was their situation? Philip and Herodias were married to each other legally, but Herodias and Herod formed a relationship. So Herodias divorced Philip legally and legally married Herod. But John, when he goes before Herod, he preached to him and said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Now, Herod and Herodias were legally married. In the eyes of the law, they were fine. But in the eyes of God, they were not. And that's why John said, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. God still viewed Herodias as belonging to Philip, not to Herod. And so he would have to put her away, send her back to her first husband, Philip, or to divorce her, just to to send her away, to dissolve that relationship that was unlawful in the eyes of God. And that's strict. They viewed it as strict. They became angry about it. It led to John's execution, as we've already talked about. And people get angry about it today. Maybe not to that extent, but they get angry about it. But it is still the truth. And we need to be careful how we receive the truth. In John's preaching, we understand on this occasion, he knew what their reaction would be. And he spoke boldly. He knew they would be angry, in other words. Now, he was arrested and he was eventually beheaded. He probably didn't see those things coming. But be that as it may, he was bold. He's very plain in his preaching and teaching. And he was not willing to bend. Jesus talked about him in Matthew chapter 11 as a man who was not in king's courts and he didn't wear fine clothing and all of that. But and that he didn't bend with the wind. It wasn't like he was a reed in the wind, that whichever way the wind blew, he bent with it. That is, whichever way men wanted him to teach, that he would teach to please people. He didn't do that. But he taught God's word regardless of the consequences, and he told men they needed to repent and turn from their sins. And that's what he did with Herod and with Herodias. And he paid the ultimate price because of his stand for the truth. And we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to pay the ultimate price when we stand for the truth? Are we willing to make the sacrifice when we stand for the truth? Are we willing to face the consequences? Because when we speak the truth, it makes Satan angry. And Satan will stir up the hearts of men, stir up their anger against us, and they will attack us for speaking the truth. Are we willing to be like John and speak that truth and not back off of it, not apologize for it, regardless of what men do? We need to be like John in that matter. And how do we receive the truth? It's another lesson we can think about. Are we like Herod and Herodias? and get angry, and maybe even violent toward people who simply tell us that we are in sin, there are changes we need to make in our life, or do we receive it? You know, we live in a society now where people are so delicate. They're so easily offended. They're offended by the least little thing. And it's as though you cannot express a thought or an idea that contradicts their way of believing or their way of living without them coming unhinged. And that's sad and unfortunate. You know, there was a time when people could have differences and sharp disagreements, but still be friends with each other, still treat each other cordially. But now it seems that that type of attitude or that type of relationship in our society is almost extinct. But can we hear the truth and hear something that disagrees with us, that is contrary to what we believe, and have the attitude that I'm going to think about that, I'm going to consider, I may not agree with it, 
right now, but I'll give it a fair hearing. And I won't get angry with that person for expressing that to me, but I'll give it some thought. And if I give it some thought and realize, you know what, they're actually saying the truth, will I act on it and do what's right? Or will I be stubborn? And will I resist it? And will I get angry? You know, I will, will I attack them? You know, that's a great lesson we can learn from this. A bad example in Herod and Herodias and what they did in reaction to truth. And we can learn we shouldn't do that. We need to hear what God has to say, whatever that truth may be. Now, another thing is we need to teach other people the truth, regardless of whatever reaction they have. But we don't necessarily need to harp on one specific thing. It's not saying we may not need to remind them of that truth and to continue to point out to them over time, you know what, this isn't something that you need to be doing that is pleasing to God and you need to change your way. But there are many things we need to teach people. We need to teach people about their moral behavior. We also need to teach them about the kingdom of God. We need to teach them about how to properly worship or pray about the relationship they have with their husband and wife or their children. So there are a lot of different things that we can teach people and not necessarily just stay stuck on one issue. It's not to say let that issue drop altogether again, but we need to teach them many different things because Being a child of God is not just about giving up sin. We definitely need to do that. But it is also about growing, about changing, about serving others, about honoring God, about having peace and hope in this life for a better existence in the next life when the Lord returns in judgment. So there are a lot of different things we can learn from the account of John the Baptist or the Immerser and his teaching of the truth and being a bold man and speaking what is right and having a great impact on the people, but also having to face the anger of men and the reaction of men and really an attack of Satan. Let us be willing to be as bold as John was and committed, no matter what the price may be, that we may please God, and when we leave this world, that we're right with God, and we have that hope of everlasting life. This program is brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, a non-denominational group of Christians devoted to following the New Testament as the sole authority for our beliefs and practices. If you live in the area, we invite you to visit our services and get to know us. We have members who drive 45 minutes to an hour one way to assemble with us. We meet on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. for Bible class and 11 a.m. for worship. On Wednesday, we have Bible studies at 7 p.m. We are located at 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. That's 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. In this study on culture and faith, we want to look at the fact that science supports creation. The first thing we want to begin with is a an observation from a book titled The Scientific Case for the Existence of God. And here's what it states. The universe is here, and there are only really three possible explanations for the existence of of what we see around us for the reality that we live in. The first one is the universe is eternal. That's the idea that everything we see, the sun, the moon, the stars, planet Earth, everything has this matter that makes up the universe is eternal and it has always existed. The second possible explanation is the universe is not eternal, but it created itself out of nothing. So there's nothing here, then boom, all of a sudden something's here, and it just happened. So that's the second one. The third one is the universe is not eternal, but it was created by something or someone. So the three again, either the universe is eternal, and it's always existed, 
the universe is not eternal and it just appeared out of nothing, or the universe is not eternal, but something or someone brought it into existence. Now, the Word of God tells us that the universe declares that there is a God, declares there is a someone behind the existence of the universe. In Psalm 19, Psalm 19, the psalmist says this at the beginning of his psalm in Psalm 19, verse 1, beginning, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and the words, their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there's nothing hidden from its heat. The universe, when you look at it, is shouting that there is a God, that there is an intelligent being behind the existence of all that we see. And in Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul tells us, that there's no excuse for people to deny the fact that God exists. In Romans 1 verse 20, says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse." There's no excuse for someone to look at this universe and then say, there is no God. That is not rational. It is not reasonable. It is not logical. Because this universe, the evidence of its existence and all the things within it, point to the fact that there is a God. There is a creator. So we want to look at this as we study the idea that science supports creation. First of all, we want to just simply go over some basic facts that God did create the universe and all things in it. And the best place, of course, to look at that is all the way back at the beginning in Genesis chapter 1. And we'll just briefly step through this in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That tells us that God was in existence because he is eternal and that he created the heavens and the earth. In other words, he created all material things, all the things we can see and touch and taste and hear, all of that. That was created by God in the beginning. And in verse 3, it says, and let there be light. So he brought light into existence. In verse 6, Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let the, it divide the waters from the waters. He created an atmosphere around planet Earth. And then you get down to verses 9 to 12. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and he, the gathering of the waters together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. He said, let the earth bring forth grass. Verse 11, the herb yields its seed, the fruit that tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself and the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields the seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So we see he made the seas. He made the dry land. He made the plants that are on the land. And then he went on to set the, the heavens in order to create the galaxies, the solar system, the sun, moon, all of that. In verse 14, said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God called the greater light to rule the day, and he created the lesser light to rule the night. 
He made the stars also. God created all those things, the heavenly bodies that we look at and we see, that give light, that amaze us. We stand in awe of the the galaxy in which we live and all other galaxies and all the stars that are out there. God made those. In verses 20 and 21, it said, Let the waters abound with the abundance of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament. And so God created the sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. God made fish. God made birds. God made all those things that we see. And God made the animals, verse 24 and 25, let the earth bring forth a living creature according to its kind, Cap, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth according to its kind. And God made all of that. God made man, verse 26. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God made it all. God spoke these things into existence. God brought these things into existence reality. God made all things, and God made all things in six days. Now, we didn't touch on it going down through here, but if you go back and read Genesis 1, it talks about the morning and the evening, or the evening and the morning were the first day, the evening and the morning the second day, and so on down through the chapter to tell us that God created all things in six days. But I want to turn our attention to Exodus 20, Exodus chapter 20, in verse 11, Exodus 20, verse 11. This is Moses writing and recording what God spoke to the children of Israel from the mountain when he gave out the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Do you see that? He's giving the command to the children of Israel to observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. The Sabbath is the seventh day. And he says that command to the children of Israel was based on the creation week because God created all things in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. Therefore, he's telling the children of Israel, you rest on the seventh day. So he created all things in six days. We could go on to Exodus chapter 31, Exodus 31 and verse 17, where he again repeats this. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. So the Bible repeats this idea that God created all things and he created all things in six days. Jesus in Mark chapter 10 tells us that God created man at the beginning of creation. Mark chapter 10, verse 6, notice this. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. You know, there are people who try to say, well, okay, God made everything, but he made it over millions of years. That's not what the Bible teaches. You have to twist the Bible and try to force something in there that doesn't belong in there. Because it says that God created man at the beginning of creation, not millions of years later, and that God created all things, including man, within six days. So the Bible tells us that God did indeed create all things. He created it in six days. Now, scientific evidence points to the fact that God did indeed create all things, and he created all things in six days. So let's talk about this for a minute. Let's look at the atheist viewpoint. And this quote that I'm giving here is from Bertrand Russell. He was a British philosopher at the late 1800s into the 1900s, and he was an atheist, didn't believe in God. Uh, this quote comes from the Georgia State University websites where I found it. So this is what Bertrand Russell says 
about the universe, why it exists. It says that man is the product of causes which had no prevision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms, that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave, that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must be inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. He says, man is an accident. The universe is an accident. And that man and all things are just going to be a pile of debris at some point in the future. That there is no ability for man and no possibility of man living beyond this world. That the grave takes you and you are finished. You don't exist anymore. Now, this quote comes from The Case for the Existence of God, and this is a quote from Dr. Robert Jastrow. It says, Only as a result of the most recent discoveries can we say with a fair degree of confidence that the world has not existed forever, that it began abruptly, without apparent cause, in a blinding event that defies scientific creation. Now, you think about that. Somebody who doesn't believe in God, somebody making a declaration that says, well, the evidence now in the scientific field is pointing to the fact that the world didn't exist before, but then it began abruptly without apparent cause in a blinding event that defies scientific explanation. Now, if you just look at that from a scientist, you understand that he's hitting all around the idea that there is a creator, that there is a God, but he just willfully, stubbornly resist accepting that reality. Scientists say that life is a result of evolution, that the universe is billions of years old. They say that that is a scientific fact, but it's not. In fact, Jastrow said it defies scientific explanation. In other words, they cannot scientifically apply these different types of things and test and, and studies and figure out how the universe got here. It's not possible to discover that through science, but what is possible is to look at what science does say and draw a reasonable, rational conclusion. And that reasonable, rational conclusion is there is a God, there is a creator. So let's think about this. True science supports creation. The second law of thermodynamics says this. The second law is an expression of the tendency that over time, differences in temperature, pressure, and chemical potential equilibrate in an isolated physical system so as to result in the natural entropic dissolution of the system itself. From the state of thermodynamic equilibrium, the law deduced the principle of the increase of entropy and explains the phenomena of irreversibly, irreversibility in nature. Now, it's a lot of big words, some of them a little difficult to pronounce at times, but here's what it is. Second law of thermodynamics is the idea everything's breaking down, okay? Everything is breaking down. Here's the way that ChristianAnswers.net put it. It is partially a universal law of decay. The universe, or the ultimate cause of why everything ultimately falls apart and disintegrates over time. Material things are not eternal. And you know what? Scientists know that. Material things are not eternal. Evolution tells us that everything's getting more complex and more efficient. Science tells us everything's breaking down over time. In Psalm 102, Psalm 102, they 
The psalmist knew this long ago and revealed this long ago. Psalm 102, verse 25. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them, and they will be changed. Do you see that? Right there is telling us what man discovered as a scientific law millennia later that everything's breaking down. The universe is decaying. It's not getting more efficient, as the theory of evolution says, but it is getting less efficient. It is breaking down. So the second thought, law of thermodynamics supports the idea of creation, supports what the Bible teaches, supports the idea of a God who created all things. There's another thing that we want to look at, the fine-tuning of the universe. Robin Collins, who has a PhD, says that gravity is fine-tuned, and this is in an interview of the case of the Creator. Now, this is what he says. Follow me on this. He says, you take a ruler that is as wide as the universe. So think about how big that ruler is. It's incredibly long, right? And we probably don't even know the edge of the universe, but we look at the universe with the abilities that we have now, and it is extremely huge. And if you took a ruler and stretched it from one end of the universe that we observe, we know about to the other end, he says, and it represents degrees of the force of strength. So each mark on that ruler represents a degree of the force of strength of gravity. Okay. So think how many billions upon billions upon billions of markers there are if you place those at one inch across the universe on a ruler. Just an unbelievable, almost unimaginable, really, number. And you mark that in those one inch increments. If you change gravity by one inch, by one inch, life is not possible, can exist. Notice what Job said relative to this concept or this idea in Job 38. Job chapter 38 and verse 31 says, Can you bind the cluster of Pleiades or loose the belt of Orion? Thinking about the idea of gravity holding the universe in its place, not allowing it to just fly off. You know, why is it that the moon stays around the earth? Why is it that the earth and the other planets continue to go around and revolve around the sun? Why does that happen? Why do we stick to this planet? It's because of gravity. Where, where does gravity come from? How, how is it fine-tuned so that life exists? So as we read a while ago from Dr. Collins, he points out that, look, you take gravity as a measure on a ruler across the universe and mark it by one-inch increments. If you just change that by one inch, life doesn't exist. So the universe is very finely tuned. Well, how did it get tuned? The answer is God. God tuned the universe. Then there's the law of biogenesis. This is in the scientific case for creation. It says that life comes only from preceding life of its own type or kind. You know, Louis Pasteur and Randolph Virchow prove that life cannot come from non-life. Every child who goes through basic science in elementary school understands life comes from life. You cannot get life out of non-life. And you go back to Genesis chapter 1, and you realize that God was the catalyst for life. You cannot get life from non-life. And it says, in Genesis 1, verse 11, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself, 
and the earth on the earth, and it was so. See, you had to have grass. You had to have trees to produce seeds to produce more grass and more trees, right? Same with fruit and vegetables, all those things. Cattle, fish, birds. You know, people have this question, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? The chicken. The chicken came first, not the egg. The chicken came first. And then the chicken produced the egg that produced another chicken that produced another egg that produced another chicken on on down through the years, right? We understand that. We intuitively see that in the world around us. Life begets life. You cannot get life from non-life, but yet the theory of evolution says life came from non-life. It contradicts everything we know relative to that question. Now then, Michael Behe, again a PhD, talks about this idea of biochemistry and irreducibly complex systems. Again, this is an interview in the case for the creator. Uh, it's the idea that a system or a device requires all the parts there to function. You pull one part out of that, it cannot function. It just cannot function at all. So an illustration of this is like a mouth trap, right? You got the board, you, you got the spring and, and the part that flips over to smash a little mouse. And you got the little bar that holds it there until it trips it, right? If you take any one of those parts out of the mouse trap, it doesn't work. It doesn't function. You take the bar that snaps over out, it doesn't function. You take the spring out, it doesn't function. You take the little thing you put the bait on out, it doesn't function. You take the board out, it doesn't function. You just cannot reduce that any more, if you will. Now, there's this thing called cilia. It's like whip-like hairs on the surface of cells, uh, causes locomotion or to move fluid across the cell. And it's made up of 200 proteins, but three parts, the rods, the linkers, the motors, each of them are needed for it to work. If you pull any one of those out, it can't work. It won't function in the cell, right? So here's the idea that you've got 10,000 proteins in a cell Three need to link together in the right way at the right place in order for this to function correctly. So here's the thing. Here's an illustration. It's like this. If you took 10,000 people to a county fair and you blindfolded them and they're not allowed to speak at all, they must find two specific people in the right sequence, the two exact people that are the correct people, and they can only unclasp and grasp another once per year. So you have three people among 10,000, all blindfolded, they can't see, they can't speak, so they can't communicate, and they randomly, once a year, grab two other people. How long is it going to take before the right three people grab each other's hands. You and I know that's just not going to happen. It's so infinitely remote. You look at that and realize, well, that's crazy. But that's what the atheists, the evolutionists, wants us to believe about ourselves and the cilia and all those things involved with how we are made up. It's just not plausible, right? All right, so the law of cause and effect. This, again, is in the scientific case for creation. You know, some cause must be greater than or superior to the universe itself. Law of cause and effect. There needs to be something greater, more powerful, bigger than the universe to bring the universe into existence. Now, again, quoting Robert, Dr. Robert Jastrow, he says the latest astronomical results indicate that at some point in the past, the chain of cause and effect terminated abruptly. An important event occurred, the origin of the world. 
for which there is no known cause or explanation. Here's the thing. You know, we don't need to worry about a hippo being in our car when we come out of the store because we know there's no cause there. So there's not going to be an effect, right? Stonehenge is there because somebody put it there. Didn't just magically appear. It didn't just the wind blow and the rain come down and all that kind of stuff. And just those stones lined up where they were. No, there was a cause there. There were people who put it there and the universe has a cause. Every house is built by someone, but he who made all things is God. Hebrews chapter three, verse four. See, there's a cause for the universe. The universe is here and there is only one rational, logical explanation, that is God. And the scientific evidence that we have supports the idea that God created all things. Let us have faith, let us have confidence, and not allow the atheist, the unbeliever around us, to cause us to doubt God. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ located in Newton, North Carolina. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to follow the Lord in all things. Do you want to study more about God's Word, His plan for saving man, or the church that Jesus established? Then please let us know and we are happy to provide you with materials for additional study. Call and request a correspondence course that will be sent via U.S. mail or to be added to the church's quarterly mail-out of the bulletin or to receive a copy of the outlines of our lessons on this program. Call us at 828-465-3009. Again, that phone number is 828-465-3009. If there is no answer, please leave a message and we will fulfill your request or return your call as soon as possible. You may also go to wordandsword.com for many more Bible study materials, including past episodes of this program, or scroll down on the homepage to take a quiz and test your Bible knowledge. Visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash wordandsword. Leave a comment about the program or ask a Bible question. If you live within driving distance, we invite you to join us in one of our services and meet us in person. We meet on Sundays at 9.30 a.m. for Bible class and 11 a.m. for worship. On Wednesday, we have Bible classes at 7 p.m. And we have classes for all ages, so bring the whole family. We are located at 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. That's 656 St. James Church Road, Newton, North Carolina. Our contact information, once more, is the phone, 828-465-3009. You can email us at contact at wordandsword.com or go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash word and sword or go to our website word and sword.com that's word a n d sword.com and our address once again is 656 st james church road newton north carolina again we thank you for watching and please feel free to reach out with your bible questions I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord, thou my great Father and I thy true Son, thou in me dwelling and I with thee one. Be thou my buckler, my sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight. Thou my soul shelter, and thou